Hello. I'd like to begin tonight with the following land acknowledgments. I am a grateful but uninvited visitor to the ancestral homelands of the Coast Salish people, past and present, including the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations, and the Duwamish peoples. I acknowledge the land occupied by the University of Washington, Seattle, and the land on which I live, learn, and practice as Coast Salish land. I recognize this land acknowledgement to be only one small act of an ongoing process of undergoing, of understanding and opposing the systematic oppression and historic and contemporary erasure of indigeneity and the indigenous peoples. We're on stolen land. Good evening and welcome. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Yvette Moy and I'm the University of Washington's Director of Public Lectures and it's so exciting to be here tonight. This is our first lecture of the academic year and we are thrilled to kick it off with Jaipreet, Dr. Jaipreet Verdi. Um, and this year, with the help of many UW faculty and staff, we are publicly celebrating the 50th anniversary of Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. This landmark legislation laid the foundation for equal access and opportunities for individuals with disabilities. And Jaipreet Verdi couldn't be a better person to kick the season off with. Um, I have a few housekeeping items to go through before we start tonight. Um, and the first is if you haven't done so already, please turn off your cell phones. Um, we ask that you refrain from video or audio recording this evening's lecture. Um, it, we are live streaming, so hello everybody out there in the live stream world. Um, and this recording will also be available on our YouTube channel um, for the Office of Public Lectures. Just Google it. Um, we also ask that you please refrain from taking photographs of our speaker while they're on the stage. Um, if you have a question tonight for our speaker, um, you can email those in to mayiask at uw.edu. And tonight's question and answer session will be moderated by the University of Washington's Dr. Heather Evans. Tonight I'd also like to acknowledge our campus partners who served as Dr. Verdi's host. Um, that would include the Disability Studies Program, the Department of History, the Department of English, and CREATE which stands for the Center for Research and Education on Accessible Technology and Experiences. Dr. Heather Evans, who reduced her many, many, many titles down to simply faculty in the Disability Studies Program in the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine, um, is going to be introducing our speaker tonight. Um, she has a lot of titles, I just want to say that. She does a lot of things for the university and we are so grateful to have her with us. And one of the other things I'm most excited about is that Dr. Evans serves on this public lecture selection committee and volunteers her time with us. Um, so with not much further ado, please welcome Dr. Heather Evans. Thank you so much, Yvette. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm so glad that you're here. Uh, as Yvette said, I am Heather Evans. You know, making our world smaller through building relationships and coming together to share ideas is such an amazing part of the UW Public Lecture Series. And I am absolutely thrilled to be part of welcoming Dr. Verdi into our UW community. Dr. J. Preet Verde is an award-winning historian whose research focuses on the ways medicine and technology impact the lived experiences of disabled people. Her first book, Hearing Happiness, Deafness Cures in History, raises pivotal questions about deafness in American society and the endless quest for a cure. She has published articles on diagnostic technologies, audiometry, hearing aids, and the medicalization of deafness, and has essays in The Atlantic, The New Internationalist, The Washington Post, Welcome Collection, Psyche, and Slate. As an educator, Dr. Verdi has taught at Toronto Metropolitan University, the University of Toronto, and Brock University. She is currently an associate professor at the Department of History, the University of Delaware, where she teaches courses on disability history, the history of medicine, and health activism. Born in Kuwait to Sikh parents, 
Dr. Verdi lost her hearing at the age of four to bacterial meningitis. By age six, her working class family immigrated to Toronto, Ontario, where she would later attend a school for deaf and hard of hearing children. A product of, quote, mainstreamed education, Dr. Verdi learned to lip read and rely on her hearing aids. She attended public high schools, then received her bachelor's degree in the philosophy of science from York University. She received first her master's, then her doctorate from the Institute for the History and Philosophy of Science and Technology at the University of Toronto, focusing on the history of medicine and technology. Her new research project historicizes how disabled people tinkered with their prostheses and perceived their devices to be a prosthetic extension of themselves. And these devices were crucial for their self-creating of normalcy. Through case studies of users adopting what Dr. Verdi refers to as, quote, the disabled gaze, this project forces us to confront how disabled people challenged ableist assumptions about their bodies and claim their own spaces to craft their identity. It is with tremendous pleasure and a great honor that I invite you to join me in welcoming Dr. J. Preet Verdi. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Heather. Oh, those lights are bright, sorry. <laughs> Um, I want to start by giving a special thank you to Yvette Moy and Kate Golden of the Graduate School of Public Lectures for organizing this, um, and especially to Heather Eben for planning a lecture series in celebration of the anniversary of Section 504, which is a tremendous landmark in disability rights. And thank you all for joining us today. I know it's very heavily raining outside, so I appreciate you all joining us here in person as well as in Zoom. Um, apparently my family and my husband has also tuned in, so <laughs> this is a way for them. <laughs> I would be remiss if I didn't give a special shout out to my Aunt Pooja, who is a UW alumni and was thrilled when I heard I was giving a talk um, at her alma mater. So, for Pooja, let's all say go Huskies in three, two, one. Go Huskies! <laughs> um, so today I'm going to be talking about the disabled gay, rethinking the past and remaking the future. Here is me, I'm very adorable. I was four years old when I became ill with bacterial meningitis and nearly died. And like many parents faced with the illness of a child, my family was overjoyed with my return to hell, but devastated by the realization that I had become deaf. My speech was reduced to a series of incomprehensible gobbles. Countless of doctors' visits, prayers, treatments, and frustration occupied our lives for months until I was sent to the Sick Children's Hospital in London, England, where I was given a large orange hearing aid with headphones, and the hearing aid was strapped in a harness on my frail chest. The promise of amplification did very little to improve my auditory world, but at the time, they were better than nothing, better than the exclusion of science. The sound, nevertheless, was still difficult to understand, and the hearing aid was very uncomfortable to wear. Two years later, we immigrated to Canada, where I received my first analog behind the ear hearing aid. They were large and awkward on my ears, and I was incredibly self-conscious about them, believing that they made my ears stick out. My hair, at the time, tied in a long braid as per Sikh tradition, did very little to hide them, or even to limit the sneakers, glances, and never-ending questions from other children. They helped me hear, I will reply, so I can hear like you do. The second answer I knew was a lie, 
because I knew no matter how hard I tried, I could never hear the way that they did. My family's response to my illness and subsequent deafness is a very common one among hearing family. It is a tragedy, a misfortune that plagues the household when a child is deprived of one of her senses. It's all too easy to see her as, quote, broken. It becomes difficult to face the new reality of special treatment and special education, but when I enrolled in the class for deaf and hard of hearing children and became familiar with others like me, slowly I came to understand what deafness would mean for my life. Speech therapy would transform global strands of words into articulated words. I was deaf, hearing aids helped me to hear, but lip reading left me fill in the blanks. I never really formally learned sign language, but I did know a few words and I did know it alphabet and used it as a secret code to talk with my friends. Still, as a child, I became obsessed with hearing, mostly out of fear that I would miss out on what everybody else was uh, experiencing. Music, TV show, inside jokes. I used to blindfold myself to train my ears to only hear through my hearing aid and not rely on lip reading. By the time my friends and I reached high school, we had carved our own paths to better adjust ourselves to the hearing world. I was placed in a gifted program and fully integrated into a hearing school, the process called mainstreaming. Some of my friends stopped speaking and wearing their hearing aids, preferring sign language as their primary mode of communication, and a few even got fitted with cochlear implants. Eventually, as I grew, I became an outsider in the same community that had once found a sense of belonging. I had an audiological impairment, yes, but I was not culturally deaf. I did not sign, I did not belong in any deaf organization or participate in any deaf event. But my accent gave away the fact that I was not truly hearing. So for years I was stuck in this limbo between two worlds, never quite deaf enough or hearing enough to fit in one world or the other. So when I first began writing my book, I had two guiding questions. First, what is it about deafness specifically that forces medical practitioners to insist on invasive treatment without guarantees of cure? And second, what's with this obsession with fixing deafness in the first place? Is this push for, for a deafness cure due to the fact that as a society, we are obsessed with stories of disabled people overcoming their limitation to achieve success as a, quote, normal individual. We are obsessed, even though this story diminish the fact that normality is relative. How many of you have been emotionally moved by videos showing a deaf person hearing for the first time? a deaf baby hearing the mother's voice for the first time. This is the moment when a device is withdrawn. And we are told when that happens, the simulation, the simulation to the world of sound is astonishing. But we are hardly ever shown the struggle. Cochlear implants don't always immediately restore normal hearing, especially in ears that have never heard sound. But what they do is they amplify sound and act as a tool that is helpful for speech recognition and also making it easier for someone to distinguish between different sounds. And wearing an implant does not mean a deaf person is miraculously suddenly cured, suddenly able to speak and hear flawlessly. Where is the story about the use of therapy and adjustment? or the fact that at the end, sometimes the user no longer wants the implant or no longer wants to wear it. Still, this switch on moment is a very powerful occurrence, a very emotionally moving incident. 
And that's because too often, the lived experience of disability are disregarded or glossed over in favor of a technological fix that is meant to be a cure. A cochlear implant is considered a prosthetic cure. And for decades, so were hearing aids. They were presented as technological cures much more than they were ever considered to be assistive devices. But if we speak specifically of deafness, what happens when the technology that is devised as a cure is turned off, removed, or put away? Do we become deaf again in need of a cure again and again? So I want us to rethink how we approach deafness and disability more broadly to consider it as an impression of difference rather than a pyramid. I want us to start by understanding an often misunderstood concept, disability. We have long been told disability is suffering, that when it comes to broken bodies and minds, it is kindness to cure, if not eliminate, the differences. We have been told disability is the opposite of ability. It is a lacking. But this is all a lie. The late Australian activist Stella Young tells us that we are sold this lie countless of times that disability is a bad thing and that those who somehow manage to live with the disability are exceptional and should be celebrated. But living with disability is part of human variation. It requires adaptation. Understanding disability requires acknowledging the variability of human experience. And on that note, I want to highlight that in January, I hope you all come out again to hear the formidable Alice Wong to speak on this topic. And she's pictured in the slide as um, wearing the pink hat. Because I don't think anyone else can talk about the variability of human experience just how Alice can. <laughs> but when we write disability history, that requires us to center disabled people. Just as race, gender, and sexuality are used as analytical lens for examining historical events, so too can disability. And if we examine history through disabled people, rather than the perspective of able-bodied society, then perhaps we can start to move away from the stigmatizing tropes of disability to create new world where disability is not oppressed, but rather celebrated. And one of the tenets of a post-human future, post-human vision, is this eradication of disability through technology. And within the sight of no future, so to speak, the disabled body gets merged with AI technology or transformed to a prosthetic superhuman. Disability futures are never thought to be desirable. So we must create a quick futurity with collective knowledge and imagined possibility, a future where disabilities welcome a knowledge of disabled ancestors and thinkers shape a new future. Just imagine that for a moment. A truly acceptable world with ramps, braille, captions, ASL, guaranteed healthcare, governed by freedom of movement and freedom of safety. A future perhaps one day will be more than a dream, but a right for everyone to live in peace. I am a historian and a deaf person who has long been fascinated by how spaces and objects can be used to understand the way disabled people navigate um, with their environments. How have they adapted technology to better align to their bodies? How have they designed or tinkered with their prosthetic or assistive aid to capture their identity? And above all, how have expectations of normality as defined by the dominant culture create tensions about what it means to be disabled? 
and now have disabled people resisted that? I first explore the tendrils of these ideas in my book, Hearing Happiness, Dubnit's Cues in History, available wherever books are sold. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so at its core, this book is about how cures for deafness imagine and forwarded no notions of normalcy that oftentimes contracted with the lived experiences of deaf people. This is a history that incorporates expectations of normalcy and how it became a comforting standard for many Americans. The idea of normalcy existed within concepts of self-cultivation and self-improvement it was used as a nexus for identifying good citizenship. So to be an ideal deaf person was to be someone who was godly, civic-minded, self-sufficient, mostly white, but above all, someone who was hearing. So I'm following the trail of the deaf people, I look to uncover stories not just of medical despair and churches for cure, but also stories of relationships and hope as deaf people negotiated with their physician, hearing aid salesmen, crack sellers, families, friends, and even themselves in this quest for normalcy. So let me show you one example. In 1919, a deaf woman named Claire B. Seaman, who lived in Ithaca, New York, wrote to Elsa Cramp, who was the director of the American Medical Association Propaganda Department, which was later renamed the Bureau of Investigation. <laughs> As director, Cramp was um, responsible for overseeing medical fraud and quackery, and he became the contact person for people across the country to write to, to ask questions about the legitimacy of medical therapy. And these letters reveal the lived realities of thousands of people dealing with um, all kinds of disabilities and diseases and sicknesses. And Clara wrote a letter as well. And in her letter, she asked whether Cram could help her select a new course of treatment, asking, there are so many ill phones, good, bad, and indifferent and so many kinds of artificial eardrums, et cetera, that one who was deaf spends a lot of time, money, and nerves trying them out. She initially debated asking another physician for advice, but explained that it was so hard to find a physician who could actually care enough and knew whether these instruments were helpful or not. And even if physician was able to help, they couldn't guarantee that the treatment could be permanent, and this is what Clara wanted Cram to confirm. Was there an effective, permanent cure for deafness that she could purchase on the health market? Now, Clara's story, like the downturn of American who wrote to Arthur Cram, are stories about the presence of normality, and above all, what hearing happiness meant to those who could hardly hear. So through the book, I show how deaf people and their families, mostly hearing families, tried ordinary and extraordinary methods in the hope of curing deafness. Of course, most of the cures were not certain, nor were they painless. But this did not stop people from either trying or recommending treatment, because even if there was a glimmer of hope that the hearing could be fully restored, then that cure was worth it. Because essentially, this is what it's like to be deaf in America. Any cure is better than no cure. Deafness is highly stigmatized, perhaps because its technology and modes of communication make this otherwise invincible disability visible. In 2015, for instance, the Australian company, Victorian Hearing, targeted the advertisement to people who might be embarrassed to wear hearing aids. The ads, with the tagline, 
Hearing aids can be ugly. It featured next to a photo of a woman wearing a pawn behind her ear. And rightfully so, these ads came under fire for deaf shaming. But these are new messages. They express a level of division that is identical to early 20th century advertisements that bolstered the visibility of their products. And it's the stigma of deafness. It's association with poor intelligence, communication, and with old age that leads to commercial hearing aids and aids to hearing more generally to be designed to be hidden. Prior to the 19th century, mechanical ear trumpets were a big spot creature designed mostly for wealthy users who had commissioned them. Clients even had options of purchasing devices that could be concealed against the skin, the hair, the clothing, um, the hair, or even disguised as domestic furniture or objects. The more inconspicuous and ornamentally designed the object, the more expensive they were. But invincibility began the central design criterion because concealing your trumpet were also perceived as being necessary to reduce any awkwardness that would arise in social conversation. But many people with hearing issues, whether congenital, temporary, or progressive, tend to turn to faithful family remedies. Sometimes they turn to advertisements for cures that promise to alleviate deafness quickly, painlessly, and discreetly, some even promising a guarantee of cure. So when commercial electric hearing aids were first introduced in 1898 by the American engineer Miller Rees Hutchinson, they presented a new technological opportunity to improve the amplification power of deaf people. Harnessing the wonders of electricity to restore deaf ear seems to be this miracle of the modern age. These first hearing aids were large carbon transmitters housed in a box that repurposed features from the carbon telephone. It was heavy but portable. You could carry the case with you where you needed it, but in order for it to work properly, you actually had to put the entire apparatus flat on a surface and make sure there was no electrical interference. But this was still a very expensive instrument, and many users who tried out the Aculion actually couldn't afford to purchase it for their own, own use. So by 1902, Hutchinson created a new version, the Acousticon, that was reduced in size and designed to be worn on the body. On the, body. the addition of vacuum tubes in the early 20th century led to drastic transformation of hearing aids by reducing the size of the transmitter and the battery um, as well as the housing case. But that is, it made these wearable devices you can wear them on your clothes, and you can actually like, make them part of your body. And the introduction of sub-miniature vacuum tubes in the 1930s further made it possible to design even smaller devices. But still, vacuum tube hearing aids were far from discreet. They tend to be very large. They required external batteries that were heavy and awkward. Sometimes the whole apparatus, when you wore it, would add an extra 10 pounds to your weight. And they were quite frustrating for many users, as you can imagine. Even more so, the part of pamphlets in the, um, instructed users to wear the hearing aids underneath the clothing in order to benefit from the invincibility, often in harnesses, as these images demonstrate. But wearing this way and concealing the wires actually restricted your body movement. Um, think of the way if you wear headphones with the wire and then you move your body, it would fall off. Um, so that was an annoyance. But um, more problematic was the fact that wearing these hearing aids underneath your clothing meant that the fabric would rub against the microphone, causing annoying sound interference and poor acoustic quality. So many users testified that wearing their hearing aid like this actually revealed their deafness 
rather than conceal that. And you should also claim that no matter how much hearing aid manufacturers boasted about their later technological advancement, their messages of technological superiority was actually lost on the consumer because they could not create a device that would allow a deaf person to pass a hearing. And this is a concept that hearing aid companies were very well aware of. And beginning in the 1930s, the company strategized how to better sell their products to resistant consumers who not only complained about the discomfort and the high cost, but also candidly expressed embarrassment about revealing their deafness. Irving Shiretel, who was the president of Sonatol, a very large um, hearing aid company at the time, expressed the obvious truth, quote, that nobody wants to put on a hearing aid, and the hearing aids are the most difficult to sell. So in response to this resistance, Charitel urged his salesmen to target the customer's psychological feelings of shame, insecurity, and embarrassment that obligated them to conceal their deafness. And the hearing aid salesmen then carry this messages directly to the consumer. Not wearing a hearing aid was more conspicuous, for no matter how well a deaf person can feel the aid with crafty fashioning, that strange deaf face, that huh, of unhearing, exposed them. The deaf face was so identifiable, um, identifiable the salesmen carried laminated cards like these to convince customers of their product benefits and the dramatic before and after results that it could provide. And these messages also aim to capitalize on beauty and territorial expectations for gender performance, messages that were made far more compelling when manufacturers combined two innovations that emerged from the Second World War printed circuit boards and button batteries that allowed them to produce even smaller models. And then the invention of the transistor, which was made commercially available in 1952, further made it possible to design powerful hearing aids. Transistor hearing aids became so popular that a year after the introduction of the market, 97% of all hearing aids that were available were transistor models. They weren't necessarily cheaper than the vacuum tube version. They weren't more reliable, nor were they more practical. What they were, however, was smaller. They were small enough to be concealed in spectacle frame, to be worn behind the ear, and concealed by clothing or skin color. They were small enough that clothing noise was no longer an issue, and you didn't need to carry extra battery packs anymore. However, as technological advancements enabled hearing aids to become smaller, Paradoxically, the stigma against deafness increased. Hearing aids, um, the industry argued, meant that deaf people no longer had any choice for not choosing hearing restoration. The messages were blunt and clear. To hear was to love. Now, advertisers, of course, were not merely, what, sorry, were merely portraying aspirational social reality, which did not always fit with how deaf people were actually integrating the hearing aid into their body or even using it as a way to express their identity. Advertising social mirror distorted and selected what it reflected. So some social realities hardly appear at all. So what can better hearing mean for those lives who's unrepresented in the advertisement? Non-white people are historically excluded from the corporate archive. They're not featured in advertisement, or at least none that I've come across prior to the 1960s, but they are stutter glimpses of marketing strategy that address race. 
um, though very infrequently. So some of these are mentioned of a range of colors. Some of them, in a very cliche way, talk about ebony and ivory models of hearing aids. But in thinking about who's left out in this history, one thing I want us to consider, how do we recognize the disparity in how hearing aids were actually designed, like the materiality of them, and the way that they were promoted? Many of these devices feature brilliant aesthetic features, sizes, and fashion, but in nearly all marketing promotion and instruction booklets, that people are told to hide them. So what happens if we flip this message to create products to be shown? What if we move away from the stigma of deafness? The design trend in hearing aids towards invincibility and miniaturization didn't displace aesthetics. Colors, style, decoration, encompass the design of hearing aids. These are all aspects that aren't really about functionality, but about appealing to a customer's personal preferences. What function is there for a blue hearing aid or a gold hearing aid? or including a deco features on the microphone grill for anything but beauty. If we shift the perspective of these objects to think about disabled youth and adaption, we can then think about a very important question. How does being disabled change the way people view the world and the things they create? One approach can be through what I call the disabled gaze. This is a perspective for understanding how people draw attention to their disability on purpose to assert their identity as a, way, as a strategic way to minimize stigma and ableism. With the disabled gaze, cure is not the solution. Adaptation and autonomy are. So one example of thinking through the disabled gaze is through the little known history of hearing aid carriers or harnesses. As I mentioned, hearing, the hearing aid industry instructed deaf users to wear the hearing aid underneath the clothing as part of the undergarment. But because this approach compromised the functionality of the device, um, because it interfered with the microphone, Many deaf users tended to make their own modification and share the solution through deaf community newspapers and magazines. So some deaf people altered handbags or made neck harnesses with lightweight, um, lightweight muslin fabrics. Others added pockets into the dresses um, or created belt bags for carrying the devices on top of their clothing. Deaf soldiers collaborated with the Red Cross to create new harnesses to better amplify sound through the microphone and which would also limit any issue they would have with um, the movement of the limbs. Women even modified commercial carriers by adding bra straps to extend the length of the, um, of the claps. And mothers even repurposed outgrown clothing to create new pockets for the deaf children to carry their hearing, hearing aids. And one of the most interesting carriers I've come across so far in my research is the one that was made by deaf painter Dorothy Brett, who lived in Taos, New Mexico. She created um, a handmade case with bordered leather and then added pieces of silver and turquoise that she had stored from the Pueblo market. And she would so she was so in love with her case and used it as a way to affirm her deafness by always strategizing to make sure it was at the center of any representation of her, including this painting, but also in photographs. So these handmade carriers are a fascinating material study of the disabled gaze. The crafting and care that involved in the creation tell us about how deaf users were thinking about how to align their body with their devices 
And through the career, we also get a sense of technological design that merges fashion and style with individual agency. That's something that can be rooted in pride and provide us with a historical legacy for uncovering intersections between class, identity, and gender. But by the 1980s, body-worn hearing aids were eventually phased out and were replaced with models that were designed to be worn behind or behind the ear completely in the ear. Then came that boring beige color um, that was standard for disappearing the hearing aid against the skin, echoing again the American cultural expectation for normality and conformity. But this does not mean the use of preferences for aesthetic disappeared, but they changed rather. Instead of carriers, deaf people began modifying the instrument directly. We see custom-made options for colored tresses or ear molds, skin covers, and charms and stickers for tubes have been available for users to personalize the hearing aid or cochlear implant. There are numerous online instructions for creating DIY hearings, um, or you can even buy them on Etsy. But collectively, what the DII adaptations do is that they demonstrate the breadth, the scope of personal aesthetics and design for assistive technology. But more importantly, they showcase this creative possibility that occurs when we push back against the medical gaze and the potential for inclusiveness when we incorporate the disabled gaze. And we see this most assuredly in the legacy of fashion and style in hearing aid design. And design here, moving beyond this creature, allows us to celebrate rather than diminish deaf identity. Now, some people still prefer to conceal their hearing aid, and that's completely okay. Deaf experience is a spectrum, and there's no one way of being deaf. But if we move away from this expectation that assistive technology needs to be concealed or minimized, this actually requires a shift in how we think about disability. Disability is in the opposite of ability. It's a variation in the human condition, a boundless way of interacting the world. It is beauty in all form, but often underrepresented, if not stigmatized, in the media around us. So if we shift our expectation from design a discretion to design a desertion, perhaps we can create new crib worlds. Culture influences technological design. What happens if we stop stigmatizing disability and begin seeing beauty and difference. Beginning with the sleek industrial aesthetics of digital hearing aids that started to be developed in 2000, designers have reconceptualized the shape of hearing aids, boring features from modern architecture, jewelry, and automotive design. But their central focus is still on this creature. So for instance, this chrome metal high gloss dawn hearing aid which was introduced into Downton 8 and designed by Stuart Cartin Design for Starkey, which is one of the top six hearing aid firms. This design received the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum People Design Award for its visual appeal, for looking sleek and cool. But the product description is boring. It introduced six colors that are designed to be virtually invincible than worn. Other design prototypes have aimed to transform hearing aids into personalized accessories, a few of which are, which are um, shown here, including using jewelry, turning hearings into eye, um, ear gadgets, having music visualizers or eyeglasses. Like these are repeat of the early 20th century design. But these are still prototypes, 
and the only suitable for people with mild hearing loss rather than across the auditory spectrum. Even Alice Turner's gorgeous Amplify, which was uh, described as a socially inclusive design and received rave review, reviews, it is reliant on bone conduction technologies and also not suitable for all deaf people. So none of the designs, for instance, would fit my profound deafness, though I have 98% hearing loss, uh, and for most deaf users in the United States, even if they wanted to get one of these, these prototypes are expensive and not covered by insurance, so they're moot, in, the, in other words. But what if we design for intention? There are bolder approaches for redesigns that seem to incorporate the disabled gaze. All the design featured up on this slide incorporate fashion with style to create standout accessories for hearing aids rather than remaking the hearing aids themselves. Some are created by deaf people, including the Finnish company Deaf Metal um, and Trello Man uh, collaboration with private policy. And their goal is to transform the hearing aid or cochlear implant into an art form. And what they want us to do is view deafness technology as earwear, the same way spectacles were rebranded as eyewear. But above all, they want us to shift our ableist conception that all deaf people want invincible devices. And the fact that there's a constant method that deaf people should feel compelled to disguise their pyramid. There's a lot about how deafness continues to be stigmatized. Even years after I came to terms with my own deafness and stopped trying to hide my hearing aids with my hair, when I was shopping for a new pair of digital hearing aids, the audiologist laid a few options in front of me. Each was so tiny that it seemed that it would be difficult for someone to notice I was a hearing aid. But she gave me an added bonus. I could select a color that could match my skin tone or hair. But when I asked her which one helped me hear, she didn't really have a good answer. But in this thing, this is just another um, example of this expectation for assimilating into hearing society that tends to congeal the stigma surrounding deafness by tying it to expectations of technology and citizenship. Then and now, there are people who decline to wear a hearing aid or refuse any kind of therapy were stigmatized, not so much for being deaf, but for refusing to be hearing. And we still tend to see this process today in the form of paternalistic reprimands calmly leveled against those who refuse to be fitted with the cochlear implant. And I predict also with the increasing um, connection to um, over-the-counter hearing aids. That is, people who prefer to be culturally deaf instead. Expected to pass his hearing and conform to social expectation to start the normality, deaf people historically have relied on hearing aids, medical treatment, speech training, and a host of unconventional therapy that promise grand miracles but often fail to deliver. And advertisers honed in this method by establishing conformity through normality, the problem of deafness was framed as nothing more than the problem of better living. To fail to assimilate into the hearing wall meant to be un-American. To fail to conform was to give up one quest for hearing happiness. And I think it's about time we move away from these ideas. Thank you.
we have time for some questions for Dr. Verde, and I'm happy to, to moderate if anyone would like to ask a question or comment. Yes. What are crip worlds? What are crip worlds? <laughs> Excellent question. <laughs> Crip world is a concept designed by um, disability scholar activists in which we incorporate accessibility of features of social life. So a crip world can be something as simple as ensuring that an event space has wheelchairs, interpreters, captions. Um, but crip world is also, I think, on a grand scheme of thing, a world in which we don't question disability or we don't question the need for introducing accessibility. It's just there. Um, so it's just imagine possibility of what a future can be. Thank you. Over here first. Oh, thank you. You spoke about ads targeting shame. I'm interested in two things in that intersection. The first one is, where did the ads uh, show up? Where did they first get placed? Lifestyle magazines, uh, local newspapers? And the second part of the question is, can you talk about the intersection of disability, especially deafness, and class? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great question. So the question is about how, where the advertisement for hearing aids were placed, and the second question is about the intersection of disability and class. And I think they're both related. Um, so national ads were placed everywhere. You can like magazines, Harper's Bazaar, um, Cosmo, Vogue, like that's where I found them. Um, there were also targeted advertisements that was based on the marketing stream of the hearing aid industry. So it's very boring, but essentially, there will be a corporation that had an advertising agency, and the advertising agency created a series of ads based on a campaign, and they would create an ad mat, which had different types of ads. So the same um, slogan, but one ad would feature a child, another one would be an old woman, and so forth. And they would give those ad mats to the distributors at a specific location. And the distributors would work with the salesmen to decide which ad to place in local newspapers. And depending on the audience, so you would have targeted ads. Um, so that's one way. And in, in relation to that, some of these advertisements also did talk about the cost of things. So when they were advertising to a working class or a lower income neighborhood, some of these ads would include like um, special layaway plans um, or special deals for their customers. Now, the hearing aids were still very expensive. They still are. The hearing aid industry is terrible because they have a markup from uh, material to retail about close to 200%. Um, and hearing aids are still not covered by insurance here because they're considered to be um, commercial product, not medical, assistive devices. So we see this ad as kind of telling about accessibility of the devices as well, in that some, some hearing aid firms also competed with each other by targeting a specific neighborhood and offering lower prices. So that is one way we can think about the marketing and revealing of class and disability, okay? Thank you. And there was another question. Sure. My question uh, is related to the research that you were talking about that you focused on and overlap with lived experiences regarding the limitation of not inclusivity within the deaf community in comparison to not inclusivity within the hearing community. And I would be interested in learning a little bit more on the lived experiences learning and research that you've done there. So yeah, interested in the lived experiences, and particularly focused on the lack of inclusivity in the deaf community, mm -hmm. but also the lack of inclusivity in the hearing community. Mm -hmm. 
and interested in your research? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I think any social group we look at, you're going to find lack of inclusive, inclusivity. I think that's just how people are. But as an historian, I can say the deaf community um, often, and that's not one community, like deaf community, they often strategize for their best interest. So one example would be after the First World War, um, as deaf people in the Northern states struggled with finding employment, and you also had this influx of soldiers who were war deafened, they created a new identifier, hard of hearing, to distinguish themselves for, from the deaf community that relied on signing. And that was primarily a strategy first to gain employment position, but also as a guard against eugenic principle uh, and policy that were rising at that time. Um, and similarly, in the 1970s, some deaf, culturally deaf people refused to align with the more um, wide stream disability, disability movement because they didn't consider themselves as being disabled, but rather they were a cultural minority. So there were like different histories and examples here and there. Um, but I don't feel like I can answer in a more broad sense. So I hope that's okay. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you. Um, well, to answer the question about sign language gloves, I think the design critic, Liz Jackson, says it best. It's a disability dongle. Um, it is something that is created with good intentions to help disabled people, but it's ultimately a useless product. I think the sign language gloves, oh, another example of this, like, paternalistic life-saving technology to ease in communication. But sign language is not just the hand movement. You know, it's body, it's gestures, it's expression. And I think reducing the language to just a series of movement with the hand is like taking away grammar from written English. But yeah, it's, it's the same level as having a wheelchair that can be motorized to climb stairs rather than just including ramps. Um, why not incorporate sign language training in all levels of society? Why not make it an official language of the country? You know, why not just learn sign language um, instead of relying on these gloves? Which I think you still need to know the language in order to understand how it works. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so my question is, anyone who studies uh, deaf history knows about the oralism movement, and I wanted to know how that played into the development and kind of the acknowledgement of hearing aids. Like, was it encouraged? Was it discouraged during that time? Um, what happened? The oralism movement? Oralism movement, oh. yeah. Okay. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with deaf education, all of them was a pedagogical movement in which deaf children were forbidden from learning um, sign, but rather taught to learn to speak English. Uh, so hearing is a part of the all of movement at later the 19th century. So many educators, physicians, and um, some acoustic scientists believed that deaf children had residual hearing. And if they could tap into that residual hearing, then they could actually help that child better enhance their speech technique. So many deaf schools, beginning from 1890s and onward, would have what they called auricular training, 
which was essentially a group of children around a room all connected to headphone, and the teacher would speak into um, the microphone. And that, would, that was useful, for, apparently, for helping the deaf children to identify sounds and spoken words to help aid in their speech. So they did go hand in hand. And again, going back to the advertisement, some of the hearing aid um, companies targeted deaf children in school by, this is the quote, saying, is your child a problem child or a hard of hearing problem child? Uh, so <laughs> you do that. design and wondering if you have any recommendations for design that can make make someone feel more heard. Is that fair? That's a fantastic question. I wish I had an answer. Uh, I really do. Um, but, but I actually don't at this moment. So I want to stew in it a little bit. Uh, but thank you. For giving me something to think about. <laughs> okay. Also, if I got the question wrong, feel free to ask again. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think you got it. Any audiologists in here? <laughs> <laughs> How will you support deaf and out of pain? <laughs> so I am an educational audiologist for a public school. Um, and it's hard <laughs> because most deaf children are born to hearing families. Um, and so part of it is 
wanting to support the child and their mm -hmm. access, mm -hmm. but also slowly bringing the families on a journey to understand mm -hmm. that this mainstream public school mm -hmm. probably isn't the best option, but it's, it's challenging mm -hmm. because ableism and autism yeah, I mean, I'm in a doubt now. Uh, I had the same audiologist for over 25 years, um, wonderful team in the city of Toronto, and they saw me grow up. So they knew, you know, about my education, my challenges, but when I moved to the United States, it took me a couple of years to find an audiologist that I trusted and that I liked. And I think the reason I like the one I have is he doesn't pressure me. You know, like, it's like we have a dialogue about what my needs are and how he can help me, with how he can find the right piece of technology to match with what I need, rather than just like prescribing it to me and expecting it, me to figure things out. Um, and, and I really do appreciate that. I do appreciate that. He does his research, he thinks about different options, he doesn't just work with some kind of formula. And he also has my book in his office. <laughs> so, come on, <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, I'm, I'm curious if co-parents are marketed differently than because now there's so much more on that end, so I'd love to hear how that would change. Um, absolutely, they are. And I've been looking into this, and cochlear implants predominantly tend to be marketed to parents of deaf children. And hearing aids tend to be marketed predominantly to older people as a way of like helping them find their vitality in life in their older age. But where are the middle age people? Where are the teenagers and the young people? They're often left out in marketing. So they are. My first thought was they're playing up um, to old tropes. Then I realized that's actually not what's happening. And I'm speaking specifically of the American market here because it is different in other countries. And I realized it's not about marketing trope, it's actually about insurance. Um, cochlear implants are covered for children up until age 18, 16 in some states, and hearing aids are covered by Medicare or Medicaid. So that explains the targeted advertisements. Um, and so that's kind of why we see these messages over and over again, but we don't really see the wide breadth, the wide range of targeted, um, advertisement, like the early 20th century one, we're hearing it about glamour, about a businessman to succeed at work or for a child to succeed in school. So I think that, is the, that explains the shift. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Question? Do you have any insights on, um, it's very obvious how America operates with advertisements and with its approach towards like cochlear implants and hearing aids. Have you had any experience or insights on another country as an example in which they're doing a good example of accessible design for the community? Um, so the question is about a comparative view of other countries. Off the top of my head, and this is something that I'm looking at, like I want to know more about the design of technology. The Scandinavian countries have the most innovative design for hearing aids. Um, Denmark especially, because Denmark has the company Articon, which is also a world leader, and then they've got bought up by an American company. But they're a leader in thinking about new innovative ways to improve the power like the amplification power of hearing aids, but also creating more like interesting design. It's also not surprising these are the countries that have universal health care. Uh, take a hint, America. Um, but there's also like different countries. So 
the UK's Natural Health Storage created their own um, state-sponsored hearing aid in the 1940s, and these designs were very limited and not really flexible, not really adaptable to a wide range of users. And even now, many deaf people in the UK under the NHS still have trouble getting hearing aids that are flexible enough to meet their needs. So there, there are variations, um, and that's as far as I can think of. I know the medical anthropologist, Mitchell Friedner, has been looking into the um, experiences of cochlear implants in India which is also really fascinating case study in thinking about accessibility and distribution as well as incorporating um, language assets. But that's all I can think of at this moment. Thank you. So to follow up on her question, suppose you know, parents come to you and ask you know, that they've got a kid and they found that they're losing their hearing you know, should I get a cochlear implant? You know, you know, we're gonna, you know, I, I decide for my child, you know, and so we'll get bilateral implants. What would you say to a, a, a parents who decide that way? What would you say to parents who decide to have their child have a bilateral cochlear implant? Parents do ask me that. I do have parents come up to me and say, oh, you seem like a successful deaf person. Can you give me some <laughs> advice on what I can do for my trial? Um, I, <laughs> I always, my response is always, um, why are you asking me? <laughs> Followed by, have you asked your child what they want? And, um, and then that's it, and then I walk away awkwardly because I don't know <laughs> how to end this question. Um, but I think this is, all, this is a bigger issue as well. You know, again, many deaf children are born to hearing families, and often a child is diagnosed as deaf at the point of a newborn auditory screening. And from that moment, the test is devised. So it is medical protocol that brings in audiologists, speech therapists, um, autologist, et cetera, to the parent's option. It's not very common to also have a deaf representative there to offer the choice of sign language as well, to help a parent decide, okay, how do I want to raise my child? Um, so there's been a push for including deaf representative in, in the medical protocol. And I, and I think that's a good first step forward. I think parents need to be fully informed because it could be terrifying. Maybe you don't know anybody who's deaf. Maybe you have no idea what deafness could be achieved. And I think above all, maybe you want your child to have a happy, successful life and you don't know how deafness is going to impact them. But I think if we break this idea that deafness is stigmatizing, that is going to ruin your life, um, then maybe we want to always see just negative responses to it. But maybe we see a positive thing. Hey, my child is deaf, oh, cool, let's train them in sign language. Um, or be like, oh, hey, have you seen that movie that has a deaf person in it? Maybe you'll connect to it. Um, so that's kind of like what I'm pushing with my work. I want us to move away from these stigmatizing tropes, from the negative perception, and think of not just deafness, but disability more broadly, uh, a different way of being in the world. So I want to include a question from our online audience. Okay. As a follow-up, how many people become deaf as teens or young adults, thinking here of loud music, accidents, illness? Does this population have particular needs? I'm thinking, too, of the fashion factor and of finances. So do different hearing aids sound differently? Do they have different timbers, et cetera? That's a great question. Uh, I don't have the numbers, um, but there is, I, I have met through my career um, people who have become deaf later in life, sometimes through genetic diseases like Usher syndrome, um, sometimes through meningitis later in life or other kind of um, illnesses. And one of the challenges is that they feel a deeper sense of loss, like they have lost a sense. 
And it is about regaining a new way of being in the world. Um, they have language abilities, um, they have speech, and they have to, in a sense, figure out how to bring sound and hearing back into their life. So, um, so that, that's as far as I, I know. But as a question about hearing aids being different, I think that's a really great question. And I can speak to my own personal experience. Um, I wore analog hearing aids for most of my life, from like six years old until 32 years old. And analog hearing aids make sound louder. And because I grew up with them, I have learned to adjust my body to different ways. And the analog hearing aids also had a telecoil switch which made me able to hear on the telephone. Um, they were also uh, repairable. Like I could take them apart and repair them and put them back together, and which was a skill set that was also made 10 years old. <laughs> but um, around the time I was in my 20s, my audiologist told me that, you know, you're going to have to make the shift to digital hearing aids. Everybody's making the shift to digital hearing aids. But I was like, but I make these ones. Like, they work for me. They do their job. And as long as I can repair them, I'm good. And by the time I was 32 years old, my audiologist told me that hearing aid companies were no longer making analog products. And the very last repair company in, had actually stopped. Like, they had shuttered. So if my hearing is fully broke, there's no place I can buy a spare part. Think of like how we've get, gotten rid of like VCRs, right? Like where are the electronic repair shops? They're gone. So the thing with digital hearing aids is they need to be calibrated. And that calibration is done by the audiologist through like a computerized system. So what they do is they try to refine your audiological test with how the computer thinks you hear sound. It took me four years to adjust, and I'm still not fully adjusted to wearing digital hearing aids. I can't explain how or why, but I don't hear the way I do. Sounds are artificial. Um, I can't hear on the telephone anymore. That's something that I had lost and grieved very deeply. Um, but I also can fix them. If they break, I have to have this whole process of like setting an appointment and getting replacements, you know, and it's more expensive. I lost that autonomy. And I think for me, that was very deeply upsetting. But then the new audiologist I have told me there's a way to bring it, analog hearing it back. So stay tuned. Okay? <laughs> I'm going to undergo this experiment. <laughs> okay. mentioned that uh, some of the like more aesthetic hearing aids are really expensive. I was wondering in what, in what ways uh, those are used to signal class, and also uh, what ways they might be used to express like race or gender and things like that. You talked about hearing aids being very expensive. So curious how different hearing aids might be used to signal class, but other identities like maybe race or gender. Fantastic question. Um, how can hearing aids signify class or gender? Um, I don't know if people can identify hearing aids the way we can, like with cell phones. Like, ooh, you have that 2014 Dawn hearing aid. Like, <laughs> I, I don't know if people can do that. But the thing about hearing aids is you don't always have a choice in what models can fit you usually based on your audiogram. So that's the test of like you hear, how well you can hear and how well you don't hear. Not all hearing aid models can match that. So even if I wanted like the best of the best hearing aid on the market, it doesn't necessarily mean that it would be good for me. So my options are restricted in that sense. Um, the people who purchase some of the prototypes, I imagine, are clearly signifying wealth in some cases. There's also people who buy um, hearing aids from eBay and then take it to the audiologist to get it refitted for their own needs. So that's another spectrum as well. The idea about over-the-counter hearing aids in the United States was the way to cut through that market of extreme options. Um, 
But one of the things I've said, I'm, I'm, I'm very critical of over-the-counter hearing aids because they um, erase the process of fitting. You can't just go pick a hearing aid and put it on and then it will help you. It doesn't work that way. Hearing aid needs to be calibrated to meet an individual's specific audiological needs. If it's not calibrated in that way, if it's not a good fit, you can risk further deterioration of your hearing, um, or you can risk like other kind of um, like a brain issue. But the other thing is, over-the-counter hearing aids are meant to target people who have most of the hearing but feel like it's starting to go to people with like mild deafness. And it's also meant to cut through the market competition. But my main critique about over-the-counter hearing is all the lobbying and fighting to get there. Why didn't you just make hearing aids covered by insurance in the first place? Right? Like that would have solved the problem for anybody who needed one rather than introducing another element in the capitalist economy uh, to buy to like bypass the hearing aid monopoly. Oh, sorry, I went on a rant there, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm waiting for people to point to let me know who's got their hand. <laughs> okay, there we go. <laughs> So, in general, uh, kind of you know, when you gave your backstory, you talk about acquiring your disability. Uh, what advice would you give to someone mm -hmm. who um, acquires deafness or acquires disability um, in the adjustment process of this new identity? Um. I think my biggest advice would be to find your community, like find your people. Um, I had my friends when I was growing up, like we were part of the same deaf and hard of hearing class, like we were bonded. Um, I kept close ties with my teacher through my entire life until she passed away from Parkinson's. Um, they made me feel like I belonged for the longest time. Um, made me feel like it was okay for me to be myself when I felt like I had to perform for other people. So my biggest advice would be just find your people. And sometimes your people can be different. They're not always like your family. Sometimes they can be your chosen family. Sometimes they can be your online friend. Sometimes they can be your peer group. But just finding somebody else to remind you of who you are um, is my big, biggest advice for anyone. Okay. Thank you. Okay, the <laughs> <laughs> So when you talked about the the switch on mm -hmm. moment, I immediately it made me think about um, maybe some of it is finding your people, but coming to disability studies or mm -hmm. critical disability studies. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about your journey in whether it's finding a community or coming to critical disability mm -hmm. studies. You might think of it as a switch-on moment for that. Yeah, my switch-on moment was the moment I realized I could no longer pass through the hearing with my digital hearing aids. It, I call that my coming out moment at deaf. I spent pretty much my teen years and my early adult years passing at the hearing, um, trying to fit in, trying to belong. There weren't a lot of deaf people around me. When I went to grad school, I was the only deaf person. I would often go to conferences, and my hearing aid would make feedback. And I knew it was me, but I'd be like, where is that noise coming from? <laughs> um, and, but now, after, in a sense, struggling with my digital hearing aid, um, there were moments when I couldn't hear the person standing next to me talking, but I could hear like conversation down the hallway. I realized passing was no longer working. Um, it was making me feel terrible about myself. I constantly felt like I was failing while I was trying to succeed and build a career. So I decided to just, one day I said out loud, I'm deaf. And the moment I said it, it was like this emotional revelation. 
And that was the switch on factor for me because it meant that, okay, what does this mean for me now? Um, what do I need to do? What, if I need accommodation, I'm not afraid to ask for it. Um, if I need to move my body so it can liberate, I'm not afraid to do that. Um, I'm not embarrassed to ask someone to repeat themselves. I'm not shy about saying I misunderstand something. And I gotta say, it is really hilarious to see airport people react when I tell them I'm deaf and the ways in which they try to accommodate my needs. So first of all, I'm always the first person on the plane, even before wheelchair user. And sometimes their way of communicating with me is also funny. One very lovely, 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 lovely man who worked at an airline that should not be named <laughs> came up to me while I was sitting in the um, disabled seating area, tapped me on the shoulder, said, So that was, that was quite funny, but um, my, my point being is like that really, like I'm, I'm okay with owning up to my deafness and that has allowed me to forge connection with some incredible people around the world. Um, it induced me to Alice Wong, um, who was just incredible. You have to come to a talk, okay? I promise you, it's going to be spectacular. It's in like January something, so Yvette will tell you. Um, but it also has allowed me to rethink about my research, my writing, a little bit differently. Um, because I wrote Hearing Happiness for everybody to understand not just the deaf world, but what it also means to grow up deaf in a hearing world. And I think telling different stories and connecting, I think that that's also part of a worldly being. Yeah. So I just want to thank everyone for being here tonight, and uh, I would say please join me in thanking once again Dr. Verdi for a fantastic. Thank you.